Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. I grew up in the suburbs of the United States and lived there for quite a while as an adult with my family. Where we lived, it was impossible for you to get anywhere by foot. If you wanted to go to church or school or even just to pick up a few items from the store, you had to have a car. Otherwise, it would take you hours to get your job done. Where I live in Malawi, I actually live within walking distance of several uh, attractions like the market. And it is so interesting to me to walk to places instead of driving because you see so many different things that otherwise you wouldn't. Uh, for example, the, the path that takes you to the market crosses over huge drainage ditches. And you cross those ditches either by walking over a narrow cement slab or you take a running jump. You see people selling all kinds of things, uh, all tropical fruits, grilled meat, even individual pieces of clothing like trousers or shirts. And that's all before you reach the market. Now, these sellers tend to set up at the same location every day. And I don't know if that's because they pay the city a a license fee in order to set up there, or uh, if it's just because people are creatures of habit. But in any case, if you walk on the same route, you're going to run into the same people over and over again. And I usually try to buy goods from the same sellers because it gives me a chance to develop some kind of a relationship with them. I recognize them, they recognize me, and maybe I'll have the opportunity to talk about things of a more spiritual nature at some point in time. Now, when I lived in Eastern Europe 20 years ago, it was a similar situation. The city in which we were living didn't have a huge supermarket. Instead, they had individual shops. In each store would sell different kinds of things. You might have one shop selling meats, another shop selling bread, another shop selling drinks. And what you do is you walk into the shop and there'd be a counter with the seller standing behind the counter and all of his stock was behind him. And so you'd have to go in there and point out each individual item that you wanted to buy and then they would hand it to you. There would be a queue of people behind you so they would all know what you were buying and of course how much you paid for everything. Now shopping is is a communal experience in so many parts of the world. It's not that way in the United States though. I did most of my shopping at a Walmart. Walmart's are pretty much the same everywhere in the world. You enter in the front door and there's somebody that says, welcome to Walmart, but you don't really pay much attention to them. And in fact, you don't even interact with with hardly anybody. Every Walmart in the world is pretty much laid out according to the same pattern, whether it's a Walmart across town or in another state or another part of the country. So you never really have to ask anybody where anything is located. And then when it comes time to check out, you don't even have to interact with any sellers because now they have self-checkout lanes. You scan your items, you bag your own stuff, and you head out the door. You know, very rarely do you run into anybody in a Walmart that you even know personally or take the time to, to greet them. 
right? Because everybody goes shopping at a different time of the day. And I think that the different experiences of shopping in the United States and other parts of the world is a reflection of the difference between what are known as individualistic societies and collectivistic societies. Let me try to explain what I mean. And in an individualist society, as you can imagine from the name, the needs of the individual are supreme. Everything in the society is oriented towards empowering an individual to achieve what he or she de decides is most important for them. A person in that kind of a society is encouraged to take advantage of opportunities of education and employment to advance themselves as far as they can take themselves. And, of course, people are judged by the merits of what they have accomplished. Without much regard to where they're from or what their parents did. Now, in a collectivistic society, the needs of the group are supreme. And so, really, everything is oriented towards preserving the honor and the cohesion of the group. And every individual is expected to submit to that dynamic. And really, regardless of what you may achieve as far as your education or your employment opportunities, you cannot grab honor and respect for yourself. It has to be given to you by the group. I've seen this play out in my own family. Uh, my, my family is from a small town in northern Wisconsin. Most of my relatives are not college educated, but I had an aunt who left the small town and made it big. She was a professor in a large American university. But when she came back to visit her, my family for the holidays, she would slide back into the role that she had before she left. I think everybody in my family appreciated the fact that she didn't try to put on airs or act like she was some kind of big shot because of what she had achieved, because I think she knew that the relatives wouldn't stand for it. Now, there's a, there's a spectrum uh, between individualism and collectivism, as you could imagine. Countries which are located in Africa and Asia tend more towards the collectivistic side of the spectrum. In the United States, the Great, Great Britain, other Western democracies tend very high towards the individualistic side of the scale. As a person who is coming from an individualistic society into a collectivistic society, this has taken a while for me to wrap my head around and still continues to cause me confusion and angst. Let me just give you one example. So I was coming back from one of my uh, excursions to the market carrying a bag of vegetables. When I got in sight of the gate of my house, the gardener, who is smaller and older than I am, is sweeping. He's busy working. He sees me, and immediately he stops what he's doing, and he runs up to me. Then he takes the bags from my hands and carries them into the house for me the last 50 yards. My American mind says to me, what are you doing? I carried this stuff for two kilometers without any problem. Why should I inconvenience you? You've got other job to do. Now, I've seen the same thing happen to me when I've gone to visit a church. I arrive with my Bible and my, and my bag, and the pastor there takes my things from me, and carries them into the church. And I have learned that resistance to this dynamic is not only futile, it causes offense. Now, why is that? Well, it's because carrying someone else's bags is a way of showing them respect. Now, people from collectivistic societies are much more in tune and sensitive to giving outward signs of respect. 
than uh, in an individualistic society where, of course, everybody is expected to carry their own weight. And it's actually a matter of pride for a person to show, look at what I can do. Uh, if you, in a collectivistic society, if you deny somebody the opportunity to carry your bags, it's like you're saying they're not worthy of giving you respect. Now, there are many other ways of showing respect in these societies. Uh, for example, total strangers uh, call me boss. The workers at uh, my house give my car a Saturday night bath. When I enter a place in my car, the guard gives me a salute. For somebody from middle-class America, it just doesn't seem right to be treated like nobility. You have to understand this works in both directions. People in a weaker socioeconomic position want to latch on to a more powerful person who will be their patron and will provide for them and all their needs that arise as if they were their children. Uh, for example, we had a gardener who was much older than myself and my wife. He called my wife his mama. Now, this patron-client relationship was at the core of ancient pagan religions. The worshipers of, of a cult to a god or a goddess would devote themselves to the service of that god or goddess. They would offer up sacrifices. They would alter their schedules to follow prescribed holidays and rituals, all with the interest that if they did everything that the god demanded, then they would be under that god's protection, and that god was bound to take care of them. Now, the Apostle Paul spent three years in the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor, spreading a totally different message, the message of Christianity. Now, so many people converted to this new religion that the city's silversmiths started a riot. Their, their business model depended on selling little silver shrines to the goddess Artemis. In the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 27, this is what we read. They were saying, There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now, these silversmiths were angry not only because Paul's message threatened their livelihoods, they also believed that their goddess's honor had been tarnished. And their fears were well-grounded because 2,000 years later, no one in the world worships Artemis of the Ephesians. People get uptight pretty quickly today in the United States over comments and actions that they feel are dishonoring their deeply held values, whether that's kneeling during the national anthem or making racist jokes on their Facebook page. People sense that the future perceptions of reality are being written today. They want to be on the right side of history. Honestly, in 2,000 years from now, nobody's going to be talking about Trump's tweets or flag burners. Whatever lessons people are trying to teach today will be long forgotten. The one truth that will remain, however, is that Christ suffered shame and dishonor on behalf of abhorrent sinners, that we might receive honor and glory forever in heaven. 
This is the one thing that we need to keep in mind. When our blood begins to boil, as we're watching the nightly news, for example, the city clerk in the city of Ephesus quieted the silversmiths by telling them that Artemis's position in their culture was secure. And the rioters went home. Oh, her glory has faded long since, but Christ's glory and our redemption is yet to be revealed. No one is going to erase Jesus' accomplishments from the record of human history. So let's not give people a reason to discredit him by our unkind words and actions. We speak the truth in love, and if we suffer dishonor alongside Christ, we know that he is our judge, and he will justify us before our enemies. When we are interacting with people of different cultures or political views, we must walk a balance between speaking truths from God's word and expressing our own opinions. I found that humor does not translate well across cultures or across political divisions. We do well to remember that no matter what other people say about us or about the Christian religion, God's power and glory will remain intact. He is capable of defending his own honor by himself. So it really is my privilege to use my words and actions to give him even more glory. And I also realize that I am only human, that I have a corrupt nature, and that I am not always tactful or loving. I ask the Lord to help me overcome my weaknesses and deliver me from evil so that I do not become a stumbling block to my brothers and sisters in the faith. The next time on Home Ties, Jesus' disciples often argued among themselves about which of them would be the greatest in his kingdom. Jesus said that his followers could expect the same kind of treatment that he himself received, rejection, ridicule, and rough treatment. All of the disciples, except John, were martyred. And so also Christian missionaries have suffered persecution throughout the ages. And this continues up to the present. We'll see you next time.